First, our first speaker is going to be Mene Youssel. Mene is Senior Vice President and Senior Research Advisor at the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas. She joined the bank in 1989 and has previously served as Director of Research, Head of the Micro Regional Energy Group, and Director of Publications. She's an expert on regional and energy issues and has published numerous articles on energy and regional growth. Mene was elected President of the National Association for Business Economics in 2017. She serves on the board of, global, of the Global Interdependence Center and the University of Texas at Dallas Energy Board. She was president of the International Association of Energy Economics in 2011 and president of the United States Association of Energy Economics in 2005. She has served on the executive boards of these two organizations, as well as the Executive Women of Dallas, Dallas Area Business Economists, the Dallas Chapter of Women in Technology International, Inc., and the Greater Dallas Chambers Board of Economists. She received the USAEE Senior Fellow Award in 2007, the Energy Journal Best Paper Award in 2009, and the Outstanding Contributions to the IAEE Award in 2015. Prior to joining the bank, she was an Assistant Professor of Economics at Louisiana State University. She has a BS and MS in Mathematics from Bogazisi University in Istanbul, Turkey, and a PhD in Economics from Rice University in Houston, Texas, and a child who, ten, who attends the University of Texas. Two. Two children at the University of Texas at Austin, trying to clean up, clean up her resume. <laughs> um, following Mene will be Clay C. Williams. Clay has served as Chairman, President, and CEO of National Oil Well Varco since May 2014. National Oil Well Varco provides oil field equipment and services globally. It is a Fortune 500 company with 35,000 employees and operations across 67 countries. Williams has worked for NOV, its predecessor companies, and their shareholders for more than 20 years serving at various times as COO, CFO, VP Finance and Investor Relations, VP Corporate Development, and VP Pipeline Services. Before joining an NOV predecessor company in 1995, Williams spent two years with SCF Partners, a private equity management firm which invests in oil field service companies, and seven years as a petroleum engineer with Shell Oil Company, where he began his career. Williams holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Civil and Geological Engineering with highest honors from Princeton University, and then cleaned up his resume with an MBA from the University of Texas at Austin. He has been named CFO of the Year by both Inter Institutional Investor and Houston Business Journal. Since 2008, Williams has served as a Director of Benchmark Electronics, Inc., a global provider of electronic manufacturing services. He is currently Chairman of the Board of Directors of the Center for Hearing and Speech, Director of the Sam Houston Area Council of the Boy Scouts of America, and a member of the Society of Petroleum Engineers. And our last panelist will be D. Keith Odin. Keith is president and co-founder of Camden Property Trust. He drives Camden's strategic initiatives, leads the property operations and corporate support services, and promotes the corporate company's culture. After completing his MBA from the University of Texas at Austin, Keith began his career as a management consultant with the then public accounting firm Deloitte, Haskins, and Sells in 1979. He joined Century Development Corporation, one of the most active real estate development firms in the Southwest in 1981, and later became director of financial planning. For 25 years, Keith has been committed to developing one of the best multifamily companies in the industry. Under his purview, Camden has successfully completed the mergers of three public real estate companies, Paragon, Oasis Residential, and Summit Properties in 1997, 1998, and 2005, respectively. His work was instrumental to the assimilation of these three companies into Camden's culture. Camden has been selected as one of Fortune Magazine's 100 Best Companies to Work For for the last 10 years. So with that, let me invite Mene up to the podium to, to give her talk, and then we'll go from there. Um, I should mention before she gets up, you've got cards uh, on your table for questions. Uh, we've done these now in Dallas uh, and Austin. I will say the question turnout was really good. So that is your challenge, um, is, is to produce great questions um, for our panelists. So be thinking about that. We'll also have mics that we'll pass around, um, so you can also ask if you prefer to do it that way rather than on, on a card. Um, the last thing I should have mentioned is there are magazines and some McCone sort of uh, data uh, on the table, but if, if any of you want more of that, just let somebody know and we'll get it to you. So with that, I'll hand it over to Manet. Thank you. All right, thank you, Jay. Thank you, Jay. Can everybody hear me? <laughs> yep, okay. I'll just stick this somewhere here. All right. Um, so I will give you a brief update on the Texas economy to sort of start us all off. But before I do that, I need to tell you that um, we have the Federal Open Market Committee meeting next week. So we are in blackout uh, this week, which means I'm going to give you my presentation, but I'm going to try to not venture into anything 
uh, too far out of that. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So Texas got back into year in 2017 after two years of slow growth, 2015 and 2016, after the oil price bust. And it wasn't just oil, because it was also a very uh, high dollar that uh, affected our exports and affected our export-related manufacturing sectors. Of course, last year we got hit with Hurricane Harvey. You guys in Houston know this really well, but um, we, it, we had a lot of devastation, but we really got back to our uh, relatively robust growth pretty, pretty fast um, after Harvey. And um, December data just came out uh, on <coughs> Friday. They were a little bit weaker than what we had seen through November. So in December, we only added Texas as a whole about 6,500 jobs. But overall, we had 2.4% growth for the year, and we added about 292,000 jobs overall in Texas. The unemployment rate in December went up a tad to 3.9%, but 3.8 was last month's. That's the lowest unemployment rate we've had since 1970. So December is still the lowest, uh, if you sort of not think about, with the exception of last month, but it's a very, very low unemployment rate. The growth is quite broad-based across sectors, and um, there are some signs of, of, of softening in the housing market, but um, recent high oil prices have really helped uh, activity in the oil sector, and, and also not just activity, but also optimism, I think, and Clay is going to talk about that. And the global economy is improving, so that is helping our exports. So we think the Texas economy is uh, going to get into higher gear in 2018. So, so this is unfortunately through September because we have December data for Texas but not for every other state. So to be able to compare, I'm showing you growth rate in Texas versus the rest of the states. And we were the second fastest growing uh, state in the nation through November. And you see that we grew quite a bit faster than the U.S., which grew about 1.4% um, through November. And I will say, I'm sorry about the slides. There was a little bit of a um, technical difficulty. So if there are funny things going on, you just have to excuse me <laughs> for those. Okay, so one of the ingredients necessary for growth is, of course, labor. And Texas has been a magnet for labor from different countries and other states for a while, for a long while, but you can see that migration, especially from domestic other states, has slowed slightly in the last uh, couple of years. Of course, part of it is due to the oil bust because the oil people were not going to the oil sector to work, but also the state wasn't growing that fast either. So there has been a little bit of a drop off, uh, but with the lowest unemployment rate in, 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 uh, since 1970, we do need workers to be able to grow the economy. So here you see month-over-month uh, -month growth in Houston and in Texas. So Houston had been growing uh, somewhat less than the state after the oil bust and um, lost about 23,000 jobs during Hurricane Harvey in August and September, but it really did bounce back. Um, 16,000 jobs in October and about 14,000 jobs in November then um, about 2,000 in December. So it sort of slowed, but still really did bounce back. Where were these jobs in, in the last two or three months? Construction, uh, about 5,000. Trade, about 8,000, and that was really retail. And restaurants, about 9,000. So all these uh, businesses came roaring back. Um, the most recent damage estimates from the hurricane for, from uh, Moody's Analytics is about 70 to 80 Seven, no, 60 to 70 billion dollars. And most of the damage, as you know, was due to um, uh, flooding. So only about a third of that is covered by insurance. So the rest of it has to come from private savings and from uh, public uh, monies. And as of late November, FEMA had spent about 1.4 billion on short-term needs like shelter and medical uh, care and so on. Small Business Administration had spent about 2.4 billion in uh, loans. Um, and the state of Texas spent about a billion, and the Red Cross spent half of the 429 million that they collected. So you can see there's a long way to go um, in, in getting Houston back up. So as I said earlier, 
Okay, well, <laughs> um, it's been pretty broad based and you can see that what this chart shows is rates of growth through December. Now this is for 2017 with, this is the major sectors of the economy starting out with the largest, which is trade, transportation and utilities, which is about 20% all the way back here to oil and gas and information. And last year and the year before, well, 2015, 2016, the good sector was very weak. So what's the good sector? That's construction, manufacturing, and oil and gas. So they were losing jobs, both in 15 and 16, but you can see that they have come back. So manufacturing grew about 3.1%, construction 37 that's especially quite strong after the hurricane, a lot of construction, and then um, energy, of course, 9%. That's about 20, 19,000 jobs. It's a small sector. So, um, But then the service sector has been growing pretty well all along and really strengthened in the second half of last year. So let me talk a little bit about um, housing. This is home price growth in uh, major uh, cities in Texas. And uh, it's still quite positive, but you can see that house price appreciation is slowing somewhat. And however, if you look at the levels of house prices, they're the highest that they've been in since 1990 in real terms. So they're at a very high level. It's just when you're at a very high level, appreciation can't grow always uh, as fast as it was. So it's, it's been slowing. Um, Houston, though, has been the weakest since the oil bust. And you can see that in the green. Uh, year over year in November, it was only about half a percent growth. Um, now, Dallas is the strongest, and Dallas was actually had double-digit growth earlier, but that slowed to about 6.5%. And Austin's appreciation also slowed, about 1.9% uh, in November. But Austin has the highest median home price in the state. It's about $297,000. Uh, um, when you talk to our contacts, what they tell us, and we'll here maybe from Keith if this is correct or not, um, that house prices uh, less than 400,000, that market is okay. Prices over 400,000, that's somewhat weak. And then the market for 250K and below is red hot, but there's not much supply um, out there. So that's what we're hearing. And th these numbers may change from metro to metro, but the trend is basically uh, the same. Looking at the multifamily sector, this is vacancy rates in multifamily. And you can see that vacancies have been declining in the 2010s, but then started moving up after 2015, after the energy bust. And Houston vacancies, of course, rose the highest. That's, uh, Houston is that purple, but you see that after prices stabilize, oil price stabilizes, especially after Harvey, those vacancy rates in Houston have really come back down. Um, Vacancies in, in the rest of the metros, especially, well, there was a Dallas there somewhere. That's the blue. Um, uh, they uh, started rising, and, and part of it is there's a lot of supply on the market. Um, and in Dallas, especially, we're seeing concessions of two to three months of uh, free rent now, especially in the uptown area. This is office vacancies and um, in different metro areas, and you can see the effect of the oil bust there in, in Houston really ramping up. Um, and it's gonna continue to rise because people tell us, or contacts tell us that there's an overhang of supply in Houston of office space. Um, it's still pretty tight in Austin and Dallas, and you can see that um, Austin, it has started to slightly pick up, but it is at uh, record low rates. So being an energy economist, I'm going to talk a little bit about oil, and then, of course, Clay will uh, take it from there. But um, so here is Texas. This is the Texas rig count in, in uh, red and Texas uh, output in blue. The rig count flattened out in about May, and it's been sort of staying um, flat around, uh, let's see, that's the 450 and 460 for total and about 420 for the oil rigs. Um, however, if you sort of look at the different basins, the Permian has started edging up, and in fact, in the last two weeks, added about 10 rigs. Um, now, when I say Permian, I'm talking both about, there's, a little, there's Permian in New Mexico, so New Mexico and Texas, it's not just Texas. Texas output, the monthly output was 3.8 uh, million barrels in October. The number that you see, so that's the reliable number. The number that you see here, 3.95, is a weekly estimate, so they can be a little bit unreliable, but you can see that output is going up. Um, 
And uh, so Texas's record output was in 1972. It was an average of 3.55 million barrels per day. Our average for 2017 was 3.51. So that means that we're going to beat that uh, record this year in 2018. So we will be at a record high uh, production rate in Texas. Um, forecast for the Permian and Eagleford together, people are talking about 5 million barrels per day by the end of the year. We'll have to see. Um, for the U.S., the weekly estimate from the Department of Energy is 9.76. Um, uh, that's for December. And the Department of Energy's short-term energy outlook came out just a week ago or two weeks ago. And they are forecasting 10.3 uh, million barrels per day on average in 2018. And if we get that, that means the U.S. will also be beating its record of 1970. Um, so, and the U.S. output is, at the end of 2018, is the Department of Energy says 10.6. There are others that say 10.7, 10.8, or, so it's, it's, U.S. output is really um, going uh, quite high. And if we do get to 10.6, that means we'll actually be the second largest producer in the world. We will have beat the Saudis, basically. Um, unless they like really <laughs> turn on the tap. Um, now this morning there was something, or yesterday there was something in the paper where the Saudi king said they are going to keep their agreement of cuts. So as you know, the 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 um, well, so keep the agreement through 2018 and maybe into 2019. So that is actually good news for our industry because you know $60, and I'll give you a little example here. $60 is sort of not a bad price. It's not the best, but you know it's better than 45. Um, so the Dallas Fed has an energy survey. We do this quarterly, and we ask a lot of questions about production, capital expenses, employment, and so on. And one of the indexes that we have is business activity. And it's a diffusion index. And you can see that in the fourth quarter, this came out um, on the 29th of December, that it actually moved up quite a bit. And why it moved up is because the percentage of people saying activity increased, that's the green, shot, uh, moved up. And the percentage of people saying, or firms saying activity decline came down. So there's increased optimism in the oil sector. Um, and if you talk to our contacts, they say majority of respondents think 61 to 65 is a good price um, for, for, for them. And they're mostly in the Permian, some in the Eagleford. They call it the Goldilocks price. Um, so what that means is that it's high enough that people are covering their costs and make some money, but it's not high enough that there's this gush of oil that's going to bring the price down. I think that's what they mean anyway. So it's, that's, that's what they call it. Now, we don't make any forecasts, but I'm going to show you a forecast here. So what this is, um, the red line is the Department of Energy forecast. The green is the NYMEX future strip, and those um, dotted lines are the 95% uh, confidence bands. So it's pretty, people are not very confident about this. Uh, <laughs> but um, what, what the numbers are, so the Department of Energy is forecasting um, $58 by the end of uh, this year, and then um, I think 55 uh, or 50. 59, sorry, 59 by the end of 2019, the strip has actually moved up since I made this chart. So it's moved up by a couple of dollars. Right now, the strip is saying that 57 by the end of this year, and then, or rather 60, sorry, by the end of this year, and 57 by the end of 2019. So people are not forecasting prices to, to, to really increase too much, but it's sort of this gold deluxe price, I suppose. Um, and if the Saudis keep to their agreement, we might be able to hold it there. Um, if they don't, well, you know. But compliance was about 129% in December. So the Saudis actually are producing a lot less. They're producing less than 10, 000, 10 million barrels per day. So they've really cut it to be able to keep that price um, constant. OK, one last, all right, um, one last uh, sector, and that's exports. So global growth has been leading tex Texas exports up. And it's been going up strongly since August. The global economy has grown stronger than we expected um, in 2017, and that has boosted the demand for our exports. And of course, the decline in the dollar uh, also helps. Um, the value of Texas exports is about 16% of the state's gross state uh, product. So it's quite a bit. It's very important for us. Um, 
So the World Bank came out with their forecast a week ago, 3.1% growth for uh, 2017, and I think 3.2 or 3.3 for 2019. 2018-2019, uh, so that's higher than what we've had before. Now, um, the IMF just came out yesterday, and their thinking um, was much higher, 3.9 for 2018. So whatever those numbers come out to be, it's good for Texas exports because the world economy is growing. Um, and also it's good because as the, as the economy grows, demand for oil and, and products goes up, so that's good for prices and that's good for the industry here. <coughs> Excuse me. And you see here, it's really the energy, it's petroleum that drives our exports. Um, so the energy sector, that's petroleum products, so that's gasoline and diesel, it's chemicals, and it's since the um, end of 2015, it's oil and gas. I mean, gas we could, we could um, export anyway, but it's also oil. We, we do now export quite a bit of oil. Um, so together they make up about 42% of states' exports, but you see that the big rise, they are driving the growth in exports. And finally, Texas is the number one exporting state in the nation, and so it makes sense that we'd have a lot of jobs that are uh, attached to exports, a large share of jobs. It's about 7.5% seven, seven of our um, of our, share, of our total employment that's tied to uh, exports. And we send about 40% of our exports to Mexico. And so these include computers, electronics, gasoline, diesel, crude oil, and transportation equipment. So about 70% of these are uh, intermediate goods, um, unlike China where it's all final goods. And so our, our trade um, with Mexico is really sort of a supplier relationship, um, supply chain relationship. Now, Mexico grew about 2.1% in 2017, and the forecast for 2018 is about 2.3, so that should help our exports also stay healthy um, this year. So finally, I'll wrap it all up. We had solid employment growth in 2017. Hurricane Harvey did cause widespread damage, but we came back and um, didn't change the growth trajectory. And we expect employment to shift into higher gear this year. Um, the risks are always the same for us. Low oil prices, bad trade policy, and labor shortages is also um, important right now. The forecast is between 25 to 3.5%. The point <laughs> estimate is about 2.8. So it's better than last year, and so we think we'll have good growth. Um, so I'll leave you with that great positive story. Thanks. Thanks, Monet. Mm -hmm. Great to see uh, prosperity return to the oil patch, and uh, and uh, very pleased to report that Texas is sort of the epicenter for that. What I'm going to talk about this morning, um, in particular, is the shale revolution, which is, uh, to me, a terrific example of how uh, the oil and gas industry has applied uh, innovation and technology to lower quality rocks. Uh, before I get into that, though, I do want to thank the University of Texas and the uh, Houston branch of the Fed for hosting us here. Uh, and in particular, the opportunity to share uh, something on a topic I'm very passionate about. Um, appreciate the, the nice introduction, Dean Hartzell. You mentioned that I started my career as a petroleum engineer. You left off the fact that I'm a big geek when it comes to technology and love this stuff. And so I love to share it with, uh, with folks. I mean, I think in a lot of ways, innovation and technology define the oil and gas uh, industry. And in fact, we trace our roots back to a very innovative entrepreneur who, in the middle of the 19th century, took state-of-the-art power generation technology. He was a retired railroad engineer, so very familiar with steam engines, and hooked up a steam engine to state-of-the-art drilling technology, which is a cable tool rig, and used a power drilling rig to drill the world's first commercial oil well in Titusville, Pennsylvania in 1859. And, uh, uh, and since that time, uh, the industry's continued to innovate and get better and more focused on efficiency and safety and, and reducing our environmental uh, impact. Um, before I get into my presentation as well, I'd like to uh, say just a couple of words about the organization that I'm very privileged to represent. I've, I've been working for 
uh, National Oil Well Varco for over 20 years, and it's a wonderful organization, 35,000 hardworking folks that I have the, the pleasure of working with who bring great products and service and technology to our, our customers in about 67 countries around the globe. We're best known for manufacturing tools used by other oil field service companies, so drilling rigs, well stimulation equipment, and that sort of, that sort of thing. So, uh, but most importantly, National Oil Well Varco traces its roots back to the earliest days of uh, the oil field. Uh, and in fact, when Edwin Drake sought to seek a, um, a substitute for whale oil, which was the predominant source of light back in the middle part of the 19th century, whales were overhunted, uh, whale oil rose to about $5 a gallon. Um, he, he sought to, to, to uh, transform rock oil into kerosene and was very successful. Our company was founded just three years later and a few miles down the road in 1862 as oil well supply. The national R name came uh, in 1893 and Varco came in 1908. So we've had sort of a front row seat since the very beginning of this industry and witnessed this industry transform itself from cable tool drilling later to rotary uh, drilling, which uh, came with the invention of the roller cone rock bit at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, and subsequent transformations throughout the history of this industry, including moving into the offshore in the 1950s. Uh, more, more recently, the, however, in about the last 15 years or so, the industry has transformed the rigs that it uses to actually conduct drilling and adopted AC technology, which is sort of the foundation of a lot of what I'm going to show you today. Uh, that really was the beginning of the shale revolution, was the capability to drill horizontally, long laterals, more challenging wells that are really only possible with uh, tier one more modern uh, AC rigs. But the point I want to stress here is throughout its history, the industry has continued to focus on uh, solving problems, improving efficiency by, by innovating continually and bringing new technology uh, to what it does. And again, the shale revolution is a great example of that. So let me show you one process in particular that we've innovated around. Um, on, the, uh, on the left there, you see the way pipe was made up when I joined this industry back in the 1980s. And so you see a rig crew there working pretty hard, big heavy tongs and, and spinning chains. On the right, you see how it's done today with uh, iron roughneck, much higher level of automation and robotics that are employed to make that operation safer. Here's the Derrick man on the left working nine stories in the air to manually rack back, back pipe. Today, we're doing that much more with automation and pipe rackers like you see there. Uh, on the right in a modern offshore rig to make, again, make our industry safer and, and more, more efficient. Um, the result is that on average, drilling rigs today drill four times the footage that they did back in the 1980s. So the driller on the right utilizing uh, much more modern tools, joystick controls, uh, software, and electronics is far more productive than the driller on the left who was working a, a big heavy brake handle and clutches and dials to drill uh, in a way that's very different. And that, again, that's the foundation that really launched the shale revolution that has returned uh, the U.S. to being the swing source of oil, as, as Manet uh, said, we're setting new, uh, new records. Um, uh, but uh, the, the concept here is that the industry continues to press into new frontiers, new more challenging rocks to meet the demands of uh, a globe that continually wants to consume more energy. So this goes back about 50 years of oil production and it shows you, you know, we started on land in the 50s, we began to produce from the offshore. As technology continued to advance, we moved beyond the continental shelf into, wa into deep water, which is beyond about 400 foot water depths, and more re recently into ultra deep water, uh, going into water depths out 3,000 3, feet or more, again, to meet the demands of a uh, energy hungry uh, population. But to me, the most exciting thing for Americans and for Texans is the shale revolution, which rests on a couple of key technologies, one invented by Earl Halliburton in the 1940s, which is hydraulic fracture stimulation. An entrepreneur named George Mitchell here in the Houston area applied this along with horizontal drilling to really launch a new way of producing oil and gas economically from really low quality rocks called shales which kicked off a decade or more of intense prospectivity around the United States and Canada applying this new technology and is leading into the application of this technology in new basins around the globe and in a lot of ways sort of reshaping um, how, uh, how the energy is produced, uh, uh, oil and gas is produced around, around the globe. So let me, I'm going to drill into this technology just a, a bit more. 
As I mentioned, it all starts with a modern AC powered rig, a, a very modern tool that looks like this, that has the capability of drilling uh, five or 10 or, or 12 or 15,000 feet down vertically and then turning the bit 90 degrees using very sophisticated downhole tools and modern bits such as a PDC bit that you see here uh, connected to a drilling motor that powers that bit, generates torque by pumping, uh, drilling fluid through that, that drilling motor and a lot of other sophisticated tools, MWD tools that measure where is that bit, the types of rocks that it's going through at the time, uh, shock tools here to isolate the, that, those electronics from vibrations that are created by the drilling process, a lot of uh, uh, very highly engineered tools in the ground that actually uh, generate that horizontal wellbore. Next we bring out uh, like a coil tubing unit like you see here, which runs a continuous length of steel tubing out down that long ladder which might extend two or even three miles horizontally to perforate that wellbore, to set plugs, to drill out plugs. That opens up the rock uh, adjacent to the wellbore to hydraulic fracture stimulation like you see here. So a fleet of hydraulic fracture stimulation equipment, 40 or 50,000 horsepower come out to pump high pressure fluid that actually breaks open the rock and pumps prop it into that rock. And it's really a combination of these two big families of technology, horizontal drilling, which drills in parallel to the strata for two or three miles or more, that opens up more of that shale to the wellbore, and then that rock is subsequently broken open uh, through dozens of stages along that lateral, and that opens up a lot of surface area. So we're able to overcome the fact that this rock has extremely low permeability with the fact that we're able to open up a lot of surface area to the wellbore and actually produce that... Uh, that rock economically, and the results have been very, very successful. So as Manet showed this uh, result for Texas, this is for U.S. Uh, production overall, um, uh, in which Texas obviously looms very large. And what you see here, again, is uh, um, lots of decades of production. The U.S. production peaked, as Manet said, in 1970 at about 9.6 million barrels a day on average, and it was in slow decline through most of my career until the last uh, five or six years. In about 2010, we turned the corner and that was solely due to this shale technology that I'm showing you this morning. And that's the, the darker green there in the, in the lower right um, uh, that's really contributing to U.S. production growth overall. And that has basically uh, pushed the U.S. back into the swing producer role uh, globally. Um, now, when I think about uh, the two main technologies, uh, hydraulic fracture stimulation and horizontal drilling, that created the shale revolution. There's lots and lots and lots of tools and technologies that build into both of those. Um, when I reflect on kind of how technologies have evolved and emerged in this industry over time, frankly, I really have to credit the downturns uh, that did that. So the basic building blocks, the tools that created the shale revolution, in my view, came out of the extraordinary long and painful downturn uh, that we all experienced in the oil patch in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, and, and so uh, lots and lots of technologies that emerged back then uh, from PDC bits to uh, MWD to top drives along with offshore innovations that came out of that. And, and the reason for that, I believe, is that when oil prices are high, our customers really want to focus on execution. And frankly, they don't necessarily want to introduce new risks, new technology risks by putting new things down their well bores or trying new things. It's when this commodity price plummets, which it does from time to time, this is a deeply cyclical industry, that we find our customers' appetite for new technology actually rises. And in fact, we've been seeing this over the last few years. Um, when the status quo is not working, you have to do something different. And so I really credit downturns with prompting innovation in this industry far more than the periods of prosperity that we go through. So I think that this, when we look backwards at the last big generational downturn of the 80s and 90s, I think it begs the question for the current downturn that we're in and have been in for the last three years is, all right, what are we going to do with this? What are we going to innovate? What new ideas are we going to employ in our industry to make it better and safer and more efficient? This morning, I want to share with you five trends that we believe uh, we're seeing underway now in the oil patch. Um, first, I believe we're going to see increasing automation across operations. Uh, second, um, uh, new software tools, machine learning, uh, and, and, and those artificial intelligence type uh, 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 technologies are very promising for our industry. Predictive analytics and big data, we're seeing adoption across our industry uh, slow but sh slowly but surely. Um, fourth, within the shale revolution, we think that our customers are more, much more focused on improving borehole quality. And then the fifth is that we believe that this, this uh, very transformative technology is going to con continue to see adoption on other continents and other basins and be applied to, to new rocks around the globe. So let me dive into each of these uh, briefly, beginning with, uh, with automation. Before I do, though, I do want to make the point that 
Our customers do produce oil and gas and sell into a commodity market, so they are price takers. So really the only thing that we can influence in the oil service industry is to reduce their cost, either their cost of development or their cost of production. And so if these technologies don't result in a lower cost per barrel, either development or lower lifting cost per barrel, then they won't meet a market demand out there and we're all kind of wasting our time. So it's a really important guideline, uh, something we remind ourselves of at NOV as we're uh, thinking about what to, to innovate on. So I'm going to start with a process that a driller goes through uh, thousands of times a year, which is basically go back to drilling after making a connection of, of drill pipe. So on the left, you see the specific steps that our driller has to remember and execute on a rig. And these are great big pieces of machinery. And on the right, you see some of the issues and some of the things that this driller is probably concerned about. Um, and, and I know many here are engaged in the oil field, and all of us in the oil patch have heard great anecdotal stories about giant leaps in productivity. We've all heard about wells that used to take 30 days that are now taking 10, which is a remarkable feat. But if you, if you pause for just a second and think about it, we're still doing the same steps. It's just that we're doing it three times the, the velocity, right, the operational cadence of the industry has risen in lockstep with these dr tremendous productivity gains. Well, think about the, 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 the burdens the, the, that are placed upon the shoulders of our driller given an operation that's going three times faster than it used to, right? We're asking a lot of, our, of the people that actually make this industry run, and this fella uh, has to be proficient at not just this particular process, but literally hundreds of other processes that go on around drilling a well. This is just one that's done thousands of, of times. That's a lot of pressure on that particular driller. We believe automation really is the key to uh, unburdening this position and unburdening the, the uh, labor challenges that this industry faces. So we ran a little experiment with our driller at our test rig in Navasota, Texas, and we asked our driller to go through this very process as many times as he could in 20 minutes. He's a very good driller, very accomplished. And basically what he's doing, he's pulling out of slips, he's turning on the mud pumps, he's ramping up RPM, he's lowering the bit to re-engage the bottom of the hole and get back to drilling. In essence, that's what's, that's what's happening. So the block uh, of the rig only moves a few feet here, and you, here we're showing you the measurement of the block. And you can see a lot of human variability. Now this has got joystick controls, it has the automation that you saw, you saw earlier. But um, I'll, I'll just make a point about this particular operation. It, it's that if he, if he re-engages the bottom of the hole with a bit and he, and he hits the bit too hard into the bottom of the hole, it'll send a vibration wave up the BHA. There's a lot of electronics in the BHA that can be damaged. He can knock cutters off of that bit. That would limit the life of that equipment down hole and may result in a early trip or early failure of that drilling run, which would be an inefficiency of this process. If he engages the bottom of the hole too slowly, the very first cutters that touch rock will send a transverse vibration wave up, which can damage electronics, knock cutters off the bit. So there's, you can hit the bottom of the hole too hard, or you can go move uh, uh, too soft, too slowly. There's sort of a Goldilocks way to go through this process. So we can write a program now that it's uh, automated, and we can actually have the software execute this, uh, this particular uh, process the same way every time with exactly sort of this Goldilocks way of doing it with no operational variation which will drive overall improvement. In effect, what we're trying to do is use software to lift up this role where this driller is not just a rig driver but rather a process, a process manager and we can do that now that we're automating more and more uh, in the field. Now once we automate rigs and equipment across the oil field, now we can bring software tools, machine learning to optimize the performance of that rig. And I'm gonna show you an example of what that looks like here. So this is actually a artificial intelligence heuristic algorithm that seeks out the optimal way to drill a particular section of rock. Uh, it constantly varies weight on bit and rotational speed, which by the way is what drillers have done since the very beginning of time. They've always sought to figure out what's the fastest way to drill this formation. And so individual drillers or rig drivers will vary those parameters that go into the rig to try to optimize how quickly they, they drill the rock. Well, guess what? The machine can do it far more efficiently, far more quickly. Um, uh, drillers change out every 12 hours. You go, you, you go to a different tower, and so you have a new driller coming into a process, relearning that process. Well, again, software sort of sidesteps all of that uh, and has great productivity uh, um, uh, uh, promise. And in fact, today, uh, by employing software, more automated rigs, we in fact have rigs that learn how to drill a certain strata of rock on their own in a far more efficient and powerful 
way. And when you do this on a program, you end up with a number of wells that are drilled more efficiently. So this is a days versus depth curve. The further to the left you are, the more efficient you are. And so this compares uh, uh, wells that are drilled with this sort of technology in red compared to what human drillers are, can do. It's important that they're faster, but it's also more important that they're more efficient. Because sh the shale technology revolution really is about well manufacturing and consistency makes as much of a difference as speed in those sorts of, of operations. But the combination of, of automation of equipment in the field and software tools then to optimize those really are designed to empower that rig crew and empower that driller and make them uh, more of a process manager so they can think about the safety of their crews, about what operation is next, rather than very intently focusing on how uh, the, the rate at which they're re-engaging the bottom of the hole, for example. I'm going to shift gears here a little bit to our third trend, which is predictive uh, analytics. We all heard a lot about big data in the oil field. So going into the deep water offshore, this is a subsea blowout preventer stack, uh, of which NOV uh, is a major manufacturer of. We analyzed six billion data points to look for the, the failure signature from a, a certain regulator valve within that stack. And what we determined is that we can actually see that uh, two weeks in advance before the regulator valve fails. So it's still working. Uh, there's a lot of redundancy built in these stacks, but we can tell our customers to switch over to the backup regulator valve and basically avoid an unplanned trouble uh, uh, cost event that would, would typically cost anywhere from, from $5 million on up to $15 or $20 million, which is an unplanned uh, stack pool. So we're applying, we're listening to the machines and basically letting them tell us before they fail what's going on. And this, again, holds huge promise for the technical equipment that's employed across this industry. Basically, like a lot of uh, mechanical equipment out there, many of our customers are engaged in calendar-based maintenance. So they routinely replace components based on time. It's sort of like changing the oil in your car every, every three months or so, um, as opposed to usage-based maintenance, which is where you change the oil in your car every 3,000 miles. What we're moving towards is actually condition-based maintenance, where you change the oil in your car when it's actually dirty. And you do that to save costs, but you actually uh, lift the overall reliability of a system. And there's a whole uh, theory here around, around when components fail. They're more likely to fail at the beginning of their lives or the very end of their lives. When they're middle-aged, uh, you don't want to touch them. And so if you introduce a, some other maintenance routine about swapping out components, you actually diminish overall system reliability. So in a lot of ways, we, we're learning if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And we're moving towards a regime of using big data to guide our, uh, our maintenance processes across the industry. At NOV, we learned uh, a lot about this firsthand several years ago when we adopted some of these processes in our own operations. We have a couple of hundred plants that manufacture equipment. We have uh, thousands of machine tools. And we actually employ a lot of these techniques in our own machine tools to help guide our maintenance and how we manufacture um, our own equipment. Number four is a focus on improving borehole quality. So for those of you in the room that are engaged in the energy business in terms of what's next for the shale revolution, this is the direction that we think it's going. And it has a lot to do with borehole geometry. So most of the rigs that are uh, out there drilling these horizontal wells um, rely on conventional, um, get this going, Re rely on conventional uh, drilling, oop, Drilling techniques that basically utilize a bent sub that, uh, that are used to drill the curve and drill out the, the long lateral and to steer into the sweet spot of, uh, of the, the formation. Um, using this conventional technique, though, results in twists and turns in the, uh, uh, in the well bore, um, which, which as you, you're drilling out 10 or 15,000 feet of, uh, I'm not sure this is going to work again, so... Um, um, what, you, what you're trying to do is steer to within the sweet spot of, of the shale, and if you can land within a 10 or 15 foot zone, that's the wellbore that's the most, uh, the most productive and has the highest return per foot of wellbore. Um, and if you can minimize the number of what are called dog legs within that wellbore, um, uh, then you, you minimize low spots that are created in the well, you minimize a lot of trouble that uh, the drillers run into, you're more likely to get casing to the bottom of, of the well bore. So it's a long way of saying that the geometry of the well matters and that there are better tools that the industry can employ to drill what we call the perfect well bore, which is shown there in blue, which is long, gun barrel straight, precisely landed in the right spot of the rock. And that many 
probably most of the attempts being done today don't quite achieve that level of perfection. So we think the next big frontier for this industry is to improve the quality of the geometry of that wellbore, and, uh, and that's what it's going to look like and, and uh, are pretty excited about advancements being made in that area. And then finally, I'm going to wrap up by uh, stating what, uh, what we believe the future holds for this industry, which is that this is very, very transformative technology. Uh, hydraulic fracture stimulation, horizontal drilling, we believe will be applied to shales and other tight sands and tight rocks and other basins around the globe, new benches across North America, and we see a growing share of global production coming from this technology per se. Today, as I mentioned, uh, it's about 5 million barrels out of 95 million barrels, so about 5% of global supply comes from the application of shale technologies. And, uh, and once again, I think the industry will continue to innovate and meet the, uh, the uh, global demand for oil and gas uh, utilizing this, uh, this very important technology. So again, thanks, great to be here. Thank you. <laughs> I want to I want to say a special thank you to to Dean Harsell for uh, including me in today's forum. Uh, you couldn't possibly know that this was the case, but this is an item today. My appearance here today uh, was a, an item on my bucket list that I made 30 years ago, and I put on my bucket list that at some time in my career in the multifamily industry that I would have the opportunity to address a crowd of really smart people on the topic of driving innovation in my industry. So uh, I, I cannot tell you the probability that I, that I associated with that 30 years ago, but it was quite small. And there, there are a number of reasons for it. Uh, the, the real estate industry has historically been known, uh, you know, you ha sort of had the two categories of early adopters and late adopters. Well, re real estate folks were in the non-adopter category for many, <laughs> many years. In particular, in multifamily real estate, uh, it was a, there were a lot of historical reasons for it, but primarily around the ownership entities that, that owned real estate up until about 25 years ago in multifamily. It was primarily individual ownership, some institutional, primarily third-party managed, uh, not a lot of capital, not a lot of national enterprises. They just didn't have the resources and capabilities, intellectual capital, and the, the money that it takes to, to really drive innovation. Well, fortunately for our industry, about 25 years ago, that all changed. Uh, in the period between 1993 and 1995, there were 34 companies, multifamily companies, that transferred from the private sector to the public sector through IPOs in the dawn of the, the modern REIT era. So we had 34, some national, some super regional, some small, and some really tiny local companies like Camden Property Trust. We went public during that, uh, during that period of 1993 to 1995, and um, to put that in perspective of what, it look, what our company looked like at the time, yeah, we'll do that. Um, so, so at the time, we went public in 1993. Uh, we owned 5,000 apartments. Uh, we were represented in only two cities, Houston, Houston and Dallas, and our entire market cap of our company was $180 million, really uh, tiny by today's standards. Today, Camden Property Trust owns 56,000 apartments across 14 cities with a total market cap of roughly $11 billion. Uh, we had, uh, beginning in, uh, at that time in, in 1993, we had access to capital. We also had the opportunity to grow. I mentioned there were 34 companies that went, went public through a period of consolidation in our industry. Uh, we merged with three of those other entities and, uh, and became the company and the platform that we have today. Along the way, we gained the intellectual capital, the resources to do the kinds of innovation that other industries had been doing for many years. Uh, we've been playing catch up for the last 25 years. Uh, and one of the reasons that we've been able to, to uh, uh, sustain our ability to innovate over that period of time is the fact that we have and maintain a very uh, active corporate culture. Uh, I mentioned in my introduction that we have been, uh, Camden Property Trust has been represented on Fortune's list of 100 best companies to work for. Uh, we've been on that list for 10 consecutive years, six of those years in the top 10. There's never been another multifamily company in the history of this country that has been represented on Fortune's list, so it's something that we're very proud of. So how does that, mat how does, how does that matter to the ability to innovate? Well, there are a lot of reasons why a great culture uh, leads to great innovation. Great cultures are uh, built on the three pillars of trust, uh, respect, and credibility. Those things only come with time and time uh, in collaboration and working together as a management team. And one of the things that happens when you have a great culture is people who join it, recognize it for what it is, and they want to be a part of it for the long term. Uh, the results are that of the 42 officers that we have in our company today, 
the average tenure of those 42 officers is 19 years. So it's a, it's, it's a remarkable uh, ability to get people to work together over a long period of time. And when that happens, you develop trust, uh, tred credibil trust, credibility, and respect, and it allows for innovation to happen. In order for innovation to happen, you have to be able to take chances, and when you take chances, you're going to fail, and you have to be part of an organization that understands that. And if you fail, that's okay. It's one step closer to the right solution. Get up and try it again. And if you have a company that supports that, you will get innovation. I, I will, uh, on this year's list, uh, 2017 list of Fortune companies, uh, included in the top 10 in that list this year were Google, Genentech, Salesforce.com, and Boston Consulting. Uh, they, these are these are uh, companies that, that have, uh, have their hallmark is, is innovation. So being, uh, having a great culture allows, allows us to, to be part of innovation. Uh, you have to be intentional about innovation. Uh, sending out a memo to the troops saying, be more creative, uh, it doesn't get you very far. So uh, on the one hand, you can't, you can't create, you just can't invent creativity, but you can in, in put processes in place that encourage creativity. One of the things that we did about five years ago is we started our innovation council in our company. And it is, I mean, it sounds like a committee. It's really not. It's, a, it's an affiliation of people who get together from all, uh, all levels of our organization. It's 22 people on the committee. We have a senior vice president who's the company sponsor. They meet once a month and for the, uh, only for the purpose of what are we missing? What can we be doing differently? What can we do, be doing better in our industry? And it's, it's led to a lot of uh, innovations that we've put in place over the years. One of the things that we um, have, have really been focused on for the last five years is this, this understanding that uh, anybody in the room familiar with Gartner? Yeah, I know, I know you are. Yeah. So I, I knew you all were smart people. So, so they're a consulting group that looks at technology trends and tries to figure out where the puck is going so that, that as uh, companies we can, we can skate to where that's going to be. So uh, Gartner uh, identified the battle for the consumer in the next decade is going to be on cu uh, customer experience and not customer service. It's the customer experience, which is the soup to nuts beginning to the end of the interaction that you have with your customer. And so I believe that, and I believe that the, the battle will be won or lost on, on, uh, on uh, uh, consumer experience. So a lot of the innovations that we've been working on and spending our intellectual capital time and money on over the last five years get at this idea of, uh, of customer experience. I'm going to give you three of them uh, that, that have been transformative for us as well as our industry. The first is revenue management. Now, I, see, I know that those of you in the room that are savvy and understand that revenue management has been around in the in the airline industry for almost 30 years. It's been adopted almost 100% in the hotel industry. Can you imagine the chaos associated with each individual uh, hotel operator pricing their rooms on a daily basis and trying to do that flying blind? It's a, it's a, it's a train wreck. Well, imagine that we have a microcosm of that in the multifamily industry. We have 56,000 apartments, 100,000 residents. We have 160 communities, 160 community managers, each charged with the task of what am I going to, what's the right market clearing price for this apartment at this moment? Uh, without technology to assist them with that and, and, and drive that decision, it can't happen. So we had, there had never been a, a revenue management solution developed for the multifamily industry. Part of the reason given was there, it, it, it's big enough, but there's probably not an adoption rate that would make it make sense. So we finally decided we've got to do it on our own. We, we, got, uh, we collaborated with a software company, and we provided the intellectual capital. They provided the software uh, and expertise, and we literally developed the first revenue management model for the multifamily industry. Uh, we rolled that out. We were the first multifamily company to roll it out system-wide, and today it's, uh, it's, it's, it's in place in, in the better companies. The folks who are worried about adoption rates in our industry were right. Uh, you know, seven years later, after our rollout of our revenue management system, there's only about a 25% adoption rate in all the multifamily industries, which is astonishing to me given the, uh, the productivity and the, the efficiency with which you can run your organization if you use revenue management. So that was a, that was a big deal for us. It's become a big deal for the top operators in the, in the, uh, in the country in the multifamily space as a game changer. The second one, if you think about customer experience and you, you want to, the, the ability to control the interaction that your customer is having at every point in contact, uh, one of the things that we, we decided to do about five years ago is we said we have to have control over the customer experience from, from initial contact all the way through. Uh, we are the only multifamily company in the country today that operates a 24-7 contact center. 
so that fr from the time that you uh, initiate an attempt to contact Camden Property Trust till the time that you move out of our apartment and even beyond that, if you call Camden Property Trust at any time of the day or night, 24-7 from any one of our 14 cities, you're going to talk to a full-time Camden employee who gets it, who understands what our standards are for, for delivering excellent customer service. So uh, big deal and also in our, in our world, uh, we, we, we have hours, but things happen after hours at our communities. We have 100,000 residents they, uh, in 160 communities, and their world doesn't stop. It starts when they get home because they're at their home and things happen. Emergencies happen after hours, et cetera. So the idea that, that our, one of our customers is going to call and get an answering service at 1 o'clock in the morning from some person in Philadelphia who really doesn't care about your problem is just is, it was unacceptable to us, so we, we developed our own contact center. Today we have 30 full-time uh, employees who, who man, our, man in uh, our, our uh, Camden Contact Center. And uh, the other thing that's, that's very important that we, we couldn't find a solution to, until, so we just invented our own solution, was that in our communities, uh, our leasing consultants, if they're engaged with a customer, phone rings, they're not going to stop the engagement with the customer ring, uh, to answer the phone. That's understandable. But our customer, our, the person who called, the, the median age of our customer is 30 years old. The median attention span of our customer is 30 nanoseconds long. <laughs> they will hang up immediately if they get an, a voice, uh, an answering machine. They hang up immediately. So they, we just, just it's an unacceptable alternative to us. So we, we fixed the problem by uh, by opening and manning our own Camden Contact Center. In, in uh, 2017, the Contact Center uh, answered and uh, and dealt with 500,000 phone calls from our residents. They also do, we also do text messaging. Some people prefer that. They do uh, email if our customer wants to engage in that way. So it's a, it's a game changer for us in, uh, in, in the ability to drive the customer experience in the direction that we want it to go. Customer sentiment. Uh, we talked a little bit about, talked a little bit about the customer experience. I'm going to, I'm going to, I know it's early in the morning. I'm going to do some math with you. But I've already established that this is a really smart group. Customer sentiment is if you're going to if you're going to uh, judge yourself and and take your company and say how are we doing on customer experience? How are you going to know? How are you going to know what your customer experience is? You got to ask them. You got to find out what your customer experience is. Now people respond to surveys in a lot of different ways, so we feel very strongly you got to have different ways of asking them, different points in time. So this is the tool that we came up with. Again, this is a proprietary tool that we use. This is actually, if you go on a, if you sign on your Camden computer, you go to the home screen, this is the first thing that pops up every morning. It's called our customer sentiment score. This score, this happens to be, these are our uh, fourth quarter 2017 final results for the quarter. And I'm going to walk you through what, what this is. On the, you obviously see the customer sentiment score in the, in the black square on the right-hand side. That is a simple average of the five inputs that we use on customer sentiment. So it, at the end of Jan, uh, fourth quarter 2017, in our entire system across 160 communities, customer sentiment score was 87.7. So is that good or bad? Well, we said a long time ago, we said when we, when we started doing this, that score was about 72. Our goal is 90. We're not there yet, but we're going to keep working at it. We have over 60 communities that are already above the 90 range, and they're so, so good on them. So just real quickly on this, uh, prospect survey on the, in the gold uh, circle, almost everybody does, does that. You walk into a community, they give you a survey, say, how do we do? That's not a big deal. Service surveys are maintenance requests. You, do, you get a maintenance request, somebody comes out, fixes your problem, they give you a survey, how do we do? How are we doing in fixing your, addressing your problems? The CLEI survey, is a, uh, a lot of you'll know it as a net promoter score. We, we survey every resident in our communities twice a year and get a net promoter score, and that comes up with that. Social Compass, this is a big deal. Social Compass is every time that Camden Property Trust, the name, one of our community's names, anything associated with a Camden name appears in any social website, in any, any review site, we capture the sentiment associated with that with a tool that we, again, worked with a software company to come up with, and we score the sentiment around that, and that score, as you can see, it was 73.5 in the fourth quarter of, of 2017, which is pretty good, and then the response rate, 98.7%, our goal is 100%. We respond to, we, we had 10,000 reviews in, in 2017, positive or negative, we, re we respond to, our goal is to respond to 100% of them, we, we hit 98.7%. So these are, these are kind of game changers in our world and how we think about innovation, and we're going to continue to push the envelope on customer experience because we think that's where the battle is won or lost. Can't do a real estate uh, presentation without showing pictures of real estate, 
Uh, this is uh, our, our newest community in Dallas, just opened up, uh, completed lease up last year at Victory Park. Uh, I, I do want to make the, the simple point about this is one of the biggest problems that we have as an industry in constructing uh, wood frame product is when you go above two levels, even if you go two, but if you go three and four levels, it's a four level wood frame product. The, one of the biggest single complaints that we continue to deal with and that we've worked really hard at is noise transmission. You can hear your neighbor, you can hear your neighbor above, the kids running across. I mean, it's just, so there's a lot of noise transmission issues. We spent a million, we spent a year studying the problem uh, and then we came up with what the potential fixes are and we, we spent an, a million dollars in sound attenuation trying to get at the sound problems, transmission problems in this project alone. Now, makes sense for us to do that because we're gonna own this property for 30 years. Our residents are gonna be part of that experience. Most people, most merchant builders would never consider doing this because they're gonna build it, and they're gonna sell it to somebody, and then the noise transmission is somebody else's problem. It's our problem, and it's our residents' problem, and we worked, we've worked really hard to fix it. Second one, this is actually uh, Camden McGowan Station, which is just, we, we're actually opening for leasing this week. Um, it's, it's in the Midtown area. Two big innovations here. There are two huge problems in the, up to, in the Midtown area, lack of parks and lack of parking. And we address both of those in, in a partnership with the city, a very innovative uh, approach. We actually have a 400 uh, uh, car parking garage built underneath this community that services this for the public use, not for our residents, for strictly for the public services, Midtown and all the, the business and, uh, that has grown up around that area. We feel very strongly that when you're developing in urban areas, you have to think about the long game, which is what we have to do, and then what do you have to do to improve not just your site, but the living conditions of, the, uh, uh, of, the, of your neighbors uh, for the long term. Second thing we did is, you can't see it, it's off to the right-hand side of this picture, in conjunction with the city, we actually developed a three-acre park. So there's a three-acre park that's available to the public. It looks like it's part of our community, and I'm fine with that, but it's really not. It's, it's a public park. So we, we, we dealt with a parking issue, and we dealt with a lack of uh, park space in downtown Houston uh, in, as part of this design effort. And finally, this is our newest community that we just announced. This will be, uh, we just broke ground on it uh, in December. Uh, this, it, it, we just across the street from the Toyota Center, uh, this is a, uh, from a design standpoint, this has all the bells and whistles that, uh, that, that are part of good design today and where we think the future is going. Uh, much more, uh, much less emphasis on what the amenity package is, much more emphasis on space, usability of space, spaces for collaboration, uh, amenities that are more uh, resort-like or, or like you think of it at a hotel, for example. We've, got, we've actually incorporated a, a, bar, a wine bar as part of one of the amenities. So just going to a whole different level in terms of our c uh, customer experience. We are, uh, we are going to continue to drive innovation. It, it works to our benefit to do the right thing on the front end because we're going to own these properties for 30 years. From the standpoint of our uh, servicing our customer, we're going to make sure that our customer experience uh, is second to none in this industry, and it's going to sustain Camden Property Trust for the next 25 years. Thank you very much. All right, thank you all very much. And um, we're, it looks like we're going to be tight on questions, just to let you know. So if you need to get up and, and, and go, at, at, uh, you know, feel free. Uh, let me throw a, a sort of a uh, one question up just to get started before we collect some more. So one of the big news items coming out of the, um, out of the holiday break was around the tax cut uh, plan. And so uh, maybe if we start, uh, start with Keith and just kind of work our way down, uh, what do you think about the impact of the of the tax cuts on your residents and your business? Yeah, so on our business, since we're a, as a real estate investment trust, we don't pay taxes at the corporate at the entity level, so we're sort of agnostic on the difference between thirty five and twenty one. Uh, we know that it'll, it probably helps some of our C corp competitors, but in the REIT space, it's kind of a non issue for us. From our residents' perspective, though, we think it's a pretty big deal. Uh, the uh, there's there's two uh, there's two areas. One uh, within the the, the Standard deduction and the change, most of our uh, residents will be greatly benefited by that. Our average household income across our platform is about $100,000 per year, so the tax cut is, is meaningful. Uh, we think our, we've done run a bunch of numbers, we think it's about a $1,300 per year uh, cash in the pocket of our typical residents, so that's a, that's a big plus. In the coastal communities in California where 
Uh, entry level homes can be a million dollars or more. The seven hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollar limitation on deductibility is a is a net plus for renting and probably a net negative for home ownership. The same with the limitation on property taxes, net negative for uh, for home ownership. A little bit of a net positive for us. The second area where it affects us in, in positively is uh, the the deduction for the dividends. We're a pass through entity, so the top rate on uh, our shareholders who have been paying 37 percent as a top rate is now 29 percent. So I think overall, from our perspective, it's a net positive for our uh, for our customers, which which is good for us. Like a lot of businesses, a lot of rejoicing at NOV over uh, the new tax code. It was long overdue. We were a multinational, as I mentioned. So out of the 67 countries we do business, I think the U.S. was was the highest statutory tax rate at 35 percent, which was um, really working against American competitiveness, um, one. Two, um, the extraterritorial ter jurisdiction where we would pay income taxes on on profits made in foreign countries within those countries, but then when we sought to repatriate that cash back to the United States, we had to pay a U.S. tax on that as well, uh, was unique to the American system, and so we're really looking forward to that, that all being cleaned up, and we have a lot of cash that has been trapped overseas. The ability to repatriate that, redeploy it in our operations gives us a lot more uh, optionality around that, that capital, so I'm glad to see the U.S., uh, the Congress finally wake up and fix what needed to be fixed a long time ago. I can't say anything national, unfortunately, due to blackout, but I'll just say a couple of things about why maybe it makes tax, it's good for Texas, the tax cut. So Texas has a larger share of people who take the standard deduction. So an increase in the standard deduction, doubling it, is actually really good for Texas uh, residents. And then uh, echoing what these gentlemen said, um, we, for example, refining industry, anybody who has their... Um, all their operations here in the U.S. is going to be very much benefited by the reduction in the corporate taxes. So our refiners are going to be in very good shape because of that, um, especially if they're only operating here. And then the last thing would be, um, since we don't have any income taxes, um, this really helps Texas versus the coastal or any other state that has high income taxes, and now you have sort of a limitation to how much you can deduct from the federal. So in that sense, uh, we could even see people moving to Texas to sort of take advantage of this uh, better uh, tax uh, environment. Let's, I'll just leave it at that. Great, thanks. <clears throat> so uh, one question, Clay, that came up is, is you showed some amazing technologies. What fraction of rigs or the industry is using that sort of the most cutting edge you're seeing um, versus the rest? And maybe the follow-up that we can uh, throw out to the panel is, as you talk about innovation and trying to attract talent, you know, you know uh, across the spectrum, how is how are these trends and and uh, market forces changing the kinds of people you're trying to trying to hire, uh, whether it's data scientists down to leasing agents? So, Clay, do you want to start with the first? You bet. Part? Great, great question. Most of the rigs drilling uh, are drilling in North America, the U.S. and Canada. Um, so it's a fair number. Um, uh, and, and I would add, most of what I showed you uh, is at work here, mostly in North America. So the opportunity, I think, for the industry is, uh, is to see this technology proliferate overseas, and there's really a, a, a big difference in terms of capability of the equipment and the technologies being employed, the U.S. vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the, of, of the world. Great, thanks. Anyone want to talk about talent? What kinds of people are you hiring, and how has that changed over time? Well, first, very pleased to be back to hiring in a few areas after a really rough three years. And, um, and it has been a difficult downturn for the oil and gas industry. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, always interested in adding great, talented people that uh, kind of get uh, the innovation uh, culture that Keith was describing earlier. That's We, tr we try, to, try to foster that as well at NOV. And, um, uh, but, but engineers, um, uh, specific areas of labor shortages that we're focused on now, Mina and I were discussing earlier, West Texas, uh, very, very low unemployment. And as, as the industry's gotten back to, to drilling in the Permian Basin in particular, uh, it's become much more challenging uh, for NOV and its customers to find, find folks there. Here in the Houston area, and this more pertains to our operations, we're more of a manufacturer and we're uh, finding it more difficult to find machinists, for instance, uh, skilled labor, uh, uh, and, and, and that's, a good, that's a good problem to solve. Uh, you know, after, after a few years of, of shrinking, uh, the problems that come with growth and finding labor, uh, we're all relieved to be working on those, those problems. Are you finding up just across the board uh, the need of people to be more 
uh, comfortable with using data. So you talked about predictive analytics and, and you know, various AI, those kinds of things. Yeah, we, we've got a great team in that particular area. Uh, uh, data scientists, if, if you've got kids that are uh, thinking about career, data, data science is a, uh, certainly a growth area. And uh, that, that area in particular, uh, I think uh, the economy is going to have a lot of demand for. Um, but, but so far, so good for us with regards to attracting uh, a talent. We've uh, got a very, it's not a big team, but a very focused team on developing the kind of products that you saw earlier. Keith, what, how's your change? So the biggest change for us in the last five years has been just driving more and more towards college degree, entry level, both assistant managers, managers in training, and, and even leasing consultants. The, the, the technology that we use today is such that you, you, almost, you almost have to have that level of critical thinking to use it. It's not, it, they're, they're tools are like anything else, but you have to have people who are, are capable of taking those fairly sophisticated tools and, and, and reaching the best outcome. So it's, a, it, it's always a little bit of a challenge in our business because it's, it's not, you know, multifamily is, has historically not been the first career path you think of. It is changing, and there are five. There are actually five programs in the country today at the university level that have a. You can get a degree in property management, and uh, and it's sort of on my long-term goals of of somehow maybe a certificate in property management at the at the um, uh, at the University of Texas. But it, it's uh, so we do recruit heavily at those schools because obviously those people have those those folks have already made the decision that they are have a very high interest level in a in a um, in a career path in, in multifamily. And again, like. Unlike 25 years ago, a career path in multifamily today can lead you to, because of the size and scale of the companies, we have all the, the opportunities and avenues for growth that any, any large uh, organization would have just within the multifamily sphere. All right, and so I know we're a couple minutes over. Just last, last question, uh, multiple questions that, I, that we received about NAFTA. So, Manet, can you talk about NAFTA in a way that's not going to get you in trouble? <laughs> um, so, so maybe, and, and, if, and if Clay if, if, or, or Keith, if you all want to weigh in, anything you, you fall on that I'll, as well? I'll just very briefly say something. So, <coughs> NAFTA has been very important for Texas. Um, and as I mentioned in my talk, the, the relationship that we have with so Mexico, we send 40% of our goods to Mexico. And the relationship that we have with Mexico um, is, is not a... Um, it, it's sort of a supply chain kind of relationship because what happens is we, we get the goods from here, we send them to Mexico, there's some value added in Mexico and they actually come back. So they feed our uh, uh, electronics industry, they feed our uh, auto industry. So if that relationship is severed or hampered in some way, that will affect the industries that not just in Texas but overall in the U.S. So I think it's an important uh, to keep that in mind and make sure that that relationship stays um, as as uh, productive as possible, let's put it that way. Right. Uh, parting thoughts? I, I, yeah. to, to me, the, the, the path to prosperity economically really is around uh, a well-trained workforce, stable tax policies, rule of law, rather than protectionism. Uh, I, think, I think consumers globally benefit from, from very efficient global supply chains, and, uh, and so uh, I think that's the right way to generate economic growth as opposed to putting up trade barriers. Great, great. So uh, I know we're a couple minutes over, but I, I hope you'll agree with me that that some of the most uh, interesting and substantive presentations uh, I've seen in a while. So uh, not, to, not to cast disparaging comments of, toward our previous events. Uh, they were great, too. Um, but I want to say thanks to, to Keith, Clay, and Manet. As always, it's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, thank you all for coming, and we look forward to doing this again next year. Thanks again to Darren and our friends at the Federal Reserve. Have a good day.